Frontier by Maggot Moshpit, Chapter Thirty. Zodi was young and ambitious. The moment he acquired his research grant from his government, the Yaren scientist hopped onto the fastest ship he could afford and made a beeline for dead space. He was certain he would solve the mystery. He was certain he was going to be the one history would remember. As he drew near, he started another log to document his journey. I'm now half an hour away from the anomaly, and I find myself getting rather excited. If my research is correct, this could mean a tremendous advancement in hyperspace technology. He did a little shuffling dance in the middle of the floor, trying to calm himself. A chime on his wrist went off, and he jumped. Oh, log out. I must take the Tajara. He rooted around in his pocket and pulled out a container of gel. He scooped some on his long finger and spread it on his head. He said a lengthy prayer and put the gel away. He felt the ship exit hyperspace, and he excitedly dashed to the cockpit, only to skid to a stop at what he saw out the window. He expected the sight to be unnerving. It was a completely black area in space, but he didn't expect it to be moving. He peered with his large eyes into the shifting shadows. It isn't supposed to do that. Suddenly, a giant tendril of darkness flicked out and grabbed the ship, crushing the hull and throwing Zodi against the wall. The last thing he saw before he was swallowed by the thing was nothing but darkness and the crack lines on the glass. May the light ever drive out the d- Lef woke up to two strange sensations. One, the overwhelming sense that something terrible had just happened, which was fading quickly, and the other was a peculiar tickling sensation all over his chest. He opened his eyes, solving the mystery of what was causing the tickling. Lena was clinging to him unusually tightly. Laugh glanced at the clock and yawned. Hey, Peach. Time to get up. She sighed and clung tighter to his side. <sighs> Just five more minutes. It was already late, and they were expecting to finally arrive at their destination later that day. There was a lot of work to do. Sorry, Peach. Come on. Get up. Lef tried to free himself from her grasp, but she actually managed to hold him down. She sighed again, and Lef could hear a very distinct sound. Lena, is something the matter? We need to get up. No! I love you! Left tugged on her arm. I know that. What's gotten into you? She opened her eyes and saw Left trying to remove her paw from his arm. As if realizing something was amiss for the first time, she slowly retracted her arm and sat up. Left looked at her with worry. Lena? What was I doing? I was still half asleep. You just clung to me and didn't let go. She felt her chest. It feels really weird. It's like... I'm kind of dizzy, but it feels good instead of nauseating? Oh my god! What? Lena sprang up and ran to the bathroom, slamming the door behind her. Lef ran after her, but the bathroom door was locked. He heard Lena rummaging through drawers and items being strewn across the floor in a frenzy. Lena, what's wrong? Damn it, Lef! Don't you remember sex ed class? He shook his head. No, I... Wait a minute, you don't mean... She flew out the door. Maybe Surlia has one! They were across the hall in an instant, pounding at the door, forgetting they were still in their underwear. Surlia, her eyes half-closed, poked her head out the door. What the hell? Lena wrenched the door open and ran into Surlia's bathroom, locking the door. Laugh paced outside the door, and Surlia watched with mild amusement instead of surprise. Um, wanna explain? Left ran his paw through his fur, his mind running at light speed. Lena woke up this morning and she was all clinging. At first I didn't realize, but now I do. It's obvious. Oh god, oh god! Sir Leo shook him. Slow down. What you're saying is impossible, though. He gulped. That's why I'm so anxious. Five minutes passed, but to left it seemed like five years. Lena finally stepped out of the bathroom, holding a vaguely thermometer-shaped device. It's positive. I'm pregnant. Left's jaw dropped. What? It must be a false positive. I ran the test three times. Left walked in a quick circle and grabbed Lena's arms. Who did this to you? One of the colonists? I'll kill- No, it! It's yours! I'm sure of it! Celia grabbed them both and sat them down on chairs. Calm down, you two. How am I supposed to be calm? Lena is pregnant with an impossible baby! Celia chuckled. What if it isn't so impossible? Lef shook his head. You don't understand. Canines and mustelids are different subspecies. We aren't genetically compatible. Lena shrugged slowly. Well, that's not totally true. 
What do you mean? She looked down with an expression of wonder on her face. Well, I read a paper a while ago. It's supposed that two genetically incompatible atrians conceiving a child was actually possible. Though the chances were so near zero, it didn't matter. And with all the stigma against two different subspecies being together, we don't have any recorded occurrence of this. It was quite interesting, actually. So, it is mine? She looked up at him. It has to be. Sirlia clapped her paws in delight. Aw, Lef, you're growing up so fast. Lef wasn't listening to her teasing. He slowly placed his paw on Lena's abdomen, then spoke as though most of his mind wasn't interested in what he was saying. We should probably get you a checkup when we stop at the medical center near Eden. To make sure there are no problems. Oh, man. Sirlia grinned. So, what are you gonna name the kid? Neither of them heard her. They were in a world of their own. Gedio enjoyed floating around the shipyards of Alpha 2 in his off time. He would flap his arms like an insect and do flips in the air. On this particular day, he was simply floating without a care in the world, snoozing among the clangs and clashes of the busy workmen around him. He sighed and opened his eyes, looking out into the stars. He frowned. Some of the stars were missing. He laughed to himself and shook his head. The stars couldn't be missing. It was probably just his head playing tricks on him. He looked again, then fear shot through his body. What the hell? Most of the stars that were in the sky were gone. Gedio could already hear the panicked yelling and screams as the encroaching darkness reached the edge of the station. Gedio grabbed the compressed air pack and accelerated away from the thing, looking back to see it devour an entire ship in an instant. He felt the force field fail, and all the air in the entire station exploded into space. Nobody was safe from the sheer force of the explosion. That's great news! Feldo patted Lef and Lena on the back in congratulation, still a little confused as to how it happened. Zack wasn't phased, and he threw his arm around Lef's shoulder. You dog. So, you getting married? Lef looked at him. Why? Feldo chuckled. Zack, on HR, marriage is only a legal contract for people to more easily share assets. It doesn't hold the same cultural significance as it does on Terra. Oh, really? Lef grinned at his lack of knowledge. Did your parents not teach you that? Well, my parents never told me anything about Atrian sexuality. I kind of wish they would have. You wouldn't believe how frustrating it is not to have your sick dance moves work on the ladies. Lena's console beeped, and the ship dropped out of hyperspace. She ran over. We've arrived in the system, and before you say anything, Lef, I can still work. He didn't answer. He just gazed at Lena with a dumb grin on his face. What? Did I get something on my muzzle? No, you're just so beautiful right now. Aww. Oh, shush you! He shook his head and cleared his throat. <clears throat> Set course for the medical center. Lena did, and they entered the Eden system. ETA, two hours. Oh, blazes! I need to tell Taliko and Yar! She jumped up and ran out the door, tugging Laugh along with her. The Eden Medical Center was built even before the planet was discovered. Constructed to provide the best care for extreme cases from any planet in no man's space, and staffed by humans and atrians alike, the facility was very impressive and huge. It was roughly a cube in shape, each corridor or room on the outside layer having a window that ran the entire length of the center, the combined lights causing the cube to glow. One side had the universal symbol for medicine on it, and the rest was white. The facilities and staff were equipped to handle anything from an alien plague to casualties from biological warfare. It was constructed in five years by both Atrians and humans, and was one of the friendliest places to go for both races. As it was being constructed, it was discovered that one of the planets in the system was habitable and very lovely, with rolling hills, low shrubs, and nutritious native fruit. Shortly after the completion of the facility, the Atrian government declared Eden open for colonization, and randomly selected Rackham's group to be the first wave of colonists. As the frontier approached, an arm reached out and slowly guided it to a free airlock. Inside, Lena, Toliko, and Yar sat at a table, chatting after Toliko almost had a heart attack from the news. Laugh was called away when they reached the center, and as soon as he left, Toliko leaned in and whispered, So, which night was it? What? Toliko giggled and nudged Yar, who smiled knowingly. You know, 
the night of conception. Tilico and Yara laughed, but Lena buried her head in her paws. Why do you always have to take it to a weird place? Tilico nudged her. Oh, come on, light it up. Lena slapped her paw, but couldn't help but laugh along. <laughs> Quit teasing. We're not teenagers anymore. All three burst out laughing. Tilico nudged Yar once he had stopped giggling. Though, I bet it wasn't as good as Yar is. She hugged him. No one is better lover than him. <laughs> oh, cut it out now. You're embarrassing me. She let go and grinned. I wonder if you'll knock me up one of these days. He waved dismissively. I doubt it. Tilico narrowed her eyes at him suspiciously. You sound like you hate the idea of having children. Well, I, I don't hate the idea, I just don't want kids. Lena could see the situation was quickly heading to a bad place. Uh, hey guys! Shh! I want to have kids someday, Yar. Even if we have to adopt. Well, I don't. I'm no good with kids. Tilico stood up abruptly. God, you're so dismissive! She turned and ran away, her last words seeming to be overtaken by a sob. Lena opened her mouth, but the intercom blared to life right next to them, Left's voice coming over it. This is your captain speaking. We have just docked with the Eden Medical Center, so if anyone is overdue for a checkup, I recommend you go aboard and arrange something. We will remain here for the next few days to give all of you enough time. Left out. Lena stood. I've gotta go. You need to find Taliko and talk to her. Yar jumped up, as though he just realized how serious the situation was. Ah, shit. You're right. He ran out the door, and Lena followed, but instead of heading towards the airlock like Yar, she went to the cockpit and tapped Left's shoulder. Hmm? Oh, want to go, Peach? Yeah. He took her paw. Don't worry, I'm sure it'll be fine. Celia waved. Have fun. Rissa sat at her desk, looking over another disappointing quarterly report. She slumped on the table. Balls deep in debt again. She picked up a calculator and began importing a long string of numbers, but was interrupted by wife beater guy. Madame, did you see the news? Rissa sighed and gave up her calculations, having forgotten the exact numbers she was trying to crunch. Ugh. <sighs> what is it? Can't you see I'm busy? He shuffled uncomfortably. Um, but Alpha 2 is gone. She looked around and saw worry on his face. What do you mean, gone? They walked to the main control room and joined the crowd of people watching a live broadcast on one of the screens. A wolf was there, standing in a room with some doctors working in the background. This is Shelley Halliburton reporting for AGNN with a new development in the case of the mysterious disappearance of the Alpha 2 repair station and possibly the missing Yaren research ship. A survivor has been recovered, one Gedeo Devora, owner and operator of Alpha 2. He's agreed to an interview. Shelley and the cameraman walked over and stood next to one of the doctors, who stepped aside and revealed a sorry sight. Gedio looked scared out of his wits, pale and wide-eyed. Shelley sat down next to him and began the interview. Mr. Devora, what exactly happened to Alpha 2? Gedio's eyes barely fixed on her face as she spoke, and it took him a moment to answer. It was like, first the stars were gone, like, like something moved in front of him. Then it reached out and... Oh, God... Shelley's voice was sympathetic, but also impatient. Take your time. It started to eat everything. Ships, people, it, the force field generator. I don't know how I did it, but I made it to a ship and jumped to hyperspace before it... His voice trailed off, and he did not continue speaking. Shelley now sounded slightly disturbed by what she had learned. Th thank you, Mr. Devora. She turned to the camera, and the operator focused on her. More details as the situation develops. Right before the live broadcast switched to the news anchor, Atrian officers could be seen approaching in the background. The news anchor switched topics to politics, and Rissa shook her head. What did I just hear? The gathered workers offered no explanation. Rissa sighed. <sighs> well, I guess this means we'll be getting more business. I just wish it didn't come with such a price. What's wrong? Zafuto was rushing the group, fear in his eyes. The, the, the stars! They're disappearing! The group began to panic, and all hell broke loose when someone yelled, We're all gonna die! Rissa wasn't so sure. She grabbed the nearest person and slapped them across the face. Be quiet, everyone! The entire room stopped in its tracks. Rissa flung the unfortunate individual back onto his feet. 
You are all going to do exactly what I say, or it's not some space thing you'll have to worry about. We're going to perform a total shutdown of all systems, including life support. Go! This time, the rush was less mad and more directed. Workers shutting down every system they could lay their hands or paws on. Soon, the station was totally dark. The light from distant stars was the only thing that could be seen, though that was fading fast. The whole station watched out the window as the stars continued to disappear. Someone whispered in the dark. Do you think this will really work? It's a shot in the dark. No pun intended. But it's the only thing we can do. They watched in silence, as though if they talked, the thing would destroy them. They watched the patch of darkness move past, marveling at the sheer size of the thing, as the stars were gone a good five minutes before they reappeared. It eventually passed completely, a patch of darkness in the far distance. It worked! There was a collective sigh of relief as people started breathing again. Rissa fumbled in the dark and restored life support, lights flickering on all over the station. Somebody get the police on the line. I think we found what destroyed Alpha 2. Yar walked through the center, trying not to get too distracted by the sheer size and impressiveness as he tried to locate Toliko. He turned a corner and saw an old Atrian fox in a wheelchair. He was staring out the window, and it looked like he had been there for a long time. If Toliko had come this way, the guy would have noticed. Yar approached and made sure he was noticed before he spoke. Uh, excuse me, sir? What? The nurse left the damn translator on. Told her a thousand times. Yeah, what you want? Um, sorry to bother you, but did you see a girl ran past here? She, uh, might have been crying? The man looked up at Yar. His face seemed to be stuck in a permanent frown, but he still managed to deepen it. What species was she? She's an Atrian. Yeah, sir. Pretty young thing, falling like nothing else. I asked her what was wrong, and she ran off down there. Thanks she didn't notice me right off. Yar was about to go off down the corridor when he was grabbed by the surprisingly strong grip of the man. Whatever you did, son, looked like it was going to take more than a box of roses to fix. You get my meaning? Yar nodded. Yeah, I, I think so. Thanks. He continued his brisk pace down the corridor, catching part of a conversation between the man and a nurse before he turned the next corner. Nurse! I told you not to leave the translator on! Mr. Stanley, there is no translator, remember? What? Now how did I know what the furry was saying? Mr. Stanley, you speak Atrian. Yar turned a corner and continued his search for Toliko. Captain Prax stood before Admiral Eddie as he explained Prax's next mission. This thing has already destroyed three ships and the repair station. We need to stop it before it does any more damage. Luckily, it seems to be moving in a straight line. He pointed at the map. There were four dots on the map, and a line connecting them. The next target of this thing seems to be the Eden Medical Center, only a few short light years away from here. Going by its speed right now, it will arrive today. I understand, sir. What are my orders? I don't like this decision but it comes directly from the higher-ups. Frankly, I think you're too independent, borderline insubordinate. He sighed. You've been promoted to... Ugh. Fleet Commander. You will command the fleet to Eden and try to stop this thing. Prax grinned and swelled with pride. I won't let you down, sir. Let's hope not. I doubt they'll be able to evacuate the Eden Medical Center in time. I've given you the flagship, the Twisted Brother. Three Sanyo cruisers, two carriers, eight light cruisers, and thirty destroyers. It's pretty much everything you will have in this sector. And the Solar Federation can't get ships here until tomorrow. Eddie ran his paw through his fur nervously. I'm going to be totally honest with you, Fleet Commander. We have no idea of what this thing is, and from what I've seen it do, we might as well be throwing pixie wings at it. I understand, sir. Eddie pointed a claw at Prax. I don't think you do. If you have to, you need to pull the fleet out of there, even if it means sacrificing the medical center. I won't throw away the lives of thousands of men trying to save another thousand. Rendezvous with the fleet in one hour at Eden. Dismissed. Prax shuffled uncomfortably. Sir, we can't just- Dismissed. 
Prax lingered only for a moment, then stepped out the door of the general's office and walked quickly down the corridor towards his old ship. Once he arrived on the bridge, his first officer stood up. Captain, your seat. I kept it warm for you. Sit down, Sylvia. I'm promoting you to acting captain of the ship. He laid out the orders he had just received. Sylvia looked disturbed, but she nodded along with his plan. Prax sat in the first officer's chair and patted her on the back. Don't worry. I've encountered something like this before. I'll be commanding the fleet from the flagship, and with a little luck, we'll stop this thing. She nodded. I hope. Helm, set a course for Eden. Maximum speed. Leff and Lena sat apprehensively, waiting for the results of the tests. After a few short minutes in a scanning machine, they had been waiting half an hour for the doctor to interpret the data. Lena watched the doctor through the window, his head nodding or lowering periodically as he worked, his lower body obstructed by the wall. What's taking so long? He's probably never seen anything like it before. Give him time. Here he comes! The doctor emerged holding a file, sat down at his desk, and smiled. Congratulations, Mr. Quill and Miss Toto. You are the parents of the first Fennec Wolverine hybrid. Lena leaned forward in amazement. Thank God! But how? The doctor's expression faltered. Well, I don't know. In every right, you shouldn't be pregnant. But the DNA came out a positive match. It's from both of you. Mostly. Left's face immediately screwed up in concern and fear. What's that supposed to mean? Calm down. There are no risks I can detect to the fetus. The DNA simply exhibited some very strange strands, probably a result of the specific union. I have one more thing. Yes? yes? The doctor smiled. Do you mind if I write a paper about this? It could make my career. They started laughing, but were interrupted. Leff clutched his head and yelled, causing Lena and the doctor to shoot up. Leff! The doctor rushed to his side, feeling his pulse. Mr. Quill, can you hear me? Yes. Ah! Once again, the world faded out, and he was in darkness. But that was all. Just darkness and nothing else. Though, as Leff tried to focus on something, anything, the endless, inky blackness began to have meaning, as though the absence of anything meant something. Leff understood perfectly what the meaning was. He opened his eyes and moved his lips. We need to get out of here. The doctor raised an eyebrow. What? He was cut off when a loud buzzer sounded and an intercom blared to life. All personnel and patients, please be advised. As of now, there is a general evacuation order in effect on the center. Please gather at the nearest muster station and await sorting into evacuation ships, which will carry you to the planet Eden. Intensive care patients will be taken. The message continued in the background as Leff ushered them out the door. There's no time to lose. It'll be here soon. Lena stopped him. Doc, you go on! You sure? Right. He scurried off and joined the flow of people. Leff pulled her. We need to leave now! Leff, what is it? He looked her square in the eye. It's nothing, Lena. And it's going to destroy everything. Prax's ship was the first to arrive. Ships were already streaming from the medical center and heading for Eden, where they assumed they would be safe. Scanning for anything out of the ordinary, sir, the sensor operator reported. Acting Captain Sylvia glanced at Prax. Nothing out of the ordinary yet, Commander. <laughs> I like that. It's got a nice ring to it. He watched out the window as ships began dropping out of hyperspace, from small maneuverable destroyers to giant carriers, all with enough firepower and men to destroy a large moon in a small amount of time. Finally, the flagship warped in. A class of its own, it was massive, with the most sophisticated sensors for exploration, the fastest drive ever invented, and the most powerful particle acceleration cannon in existence. Many people called it the egg due to its oblong shape and smooth surface. Sylvia, I'll be leaving the endless ocean in your capable paws. Hail the twisted brother. Tell Captain Umatani I'll be joining him shortly. Sylvia shook his paw. Good luck. Prax completed the short shuttle ride over and headed for the bridge. The bridge was huge, with tactical displays everywhere, crew running around with reports and other things, a huge screen which doubled as a window, now showing the fleet in a standard idle wedge formation. The weasel captain Umatani was one of the most respected captains ever, and he greeted Prax with a bow. Sir, 42 wings report normal status and ready to deploy. The repass is experiencing drive trouble and won't join us for another few hours. 
Prax nodded and walked to the rear of the bridge, where a table displayed a map of the system, the medical center, and each ship in the fleet. Umatani joined him, and so did his tactical officer. Prax pointed to the edge of the table and drew a line with his claw, intersecting with the medical center. This is the angle we think this thing will approach from. We will deploy the fleet here and here. We'll have the carriers orbit these moons. That way, if they need to bring their big guns online, it won't interfere with the other ships. We'll have them send out the fighters now and deploy them with the rest of the fleet. As for us, we'll be front and center. They were about to leave and carry out his orders when he stopped them. Listen, send out a probe, and have them send out a message saying we want to talk in every language and code you can. Yes, I would have done the same, but from what I hear, the thing can't be reasoned with. I want to cover all our bases. Umatani nodded, then gestured at the tactical officer, who went off to deploy the beacon. Prax watched the screen as the fleet deployed, spreading out in a net-like formation, bigger ships in the rear, smaller ships out front. One of the officers tapped him on the shoulder, and he looked around. Yes? Sir, I think we have something. She led him to the sensor station, then pointed at the screen. We tried to scan a section of space, but we didn't get the sensor beam back. It's as if something just ate it. Prax felt a cold chill run down his back. Put that region on screen. All eyes turned to the window as it switched from a fleet to a section of stars. Prax and Umatani stepped closer to examine it. Anything unusual? Not that I can. Wait. He peered closer at the screen. Zoom into sector 9G. The screen shifted and became black. Prax stepped back. What? Zoom out a bit. This time, a few stars could be seen on the edge of the screen, sometimes blinking in and out of existence. That would be it. Matches every description. The tactical officer spoke up. At the rate those stars are disappearing, the computer calculates the thing will be upon us in 20 minutes. Prax and Umatani exchanged glances, then sat in their chairs. All ships, battle stations! All ships reporting battle stations, fleet commander. Prax watched as the stars continued to wink out. What do you think it is, Captain? Looks like nothing for fleet commander. Yar ignored the evacuation announcement and continued pursuing Toliko, who he had caught a glimpse of. She wasn't heading to any of the muster stations, and the last he saw her, she had ducked into a storeroom. He stood outside the door, but couldn't muster up the courage to open it. Toliko! I, I want to talk, but didn't you hear the evacuation announcement? We should leave. He looked around, then stepped inside, the door swinging shut behind him. Toliko was sitting on the floor, arms around her knees. Yar sat next to her, and she abruptly hugged him tight, pressing her face against his shoulder. I really want kids, Yar. I know, my love, but something's up. We need to evacuate. She sniffed and stood with Yar. Alright, I don't know what came over me. Don't worry about it. Hey, what's this? He pulled on the knob and twisted it several times, but it did not move. It's locked? They both looked at each other, then out the window at the assembled fleet.